My name is Gabriel. I'm with 10 Pound Gorilla, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the recently open sourced StyleX by Meta. So, first, looking at kind of what StyleX even is, um, it's a new CSS styling system designed by Meta that was recently released, but it's it works a bit differently because it's a CSS in JavaScript system where it Basically, you need to code all of your styles through JavaScript objects, but there are some benefits to this um, that we can look at later. So this is best suited for projects that the UI is developed in JavaScript, something like React, um, just to allow it to work properly because uh, it requires compilation and uh, some other things that are natural to those types of systems. And it's actually framework agnostic, so it doesn't require React, but that type of system, as long as it accepts certain things, is uh, kind of what it's targeted for. So another thing that it's, it's made for is that it allows for reusable components to be developed, that you have the styles inside the component effectively, and um, this means that that component can be published to like NPM and other people can use it. And the styles for that will be automatically merged when they start using the component. And basically just makes it a little bit more seamless while remaining customizable. So some features and benefits uh, listed on their site. So for scalability, it uses atomic CSS and basically just generates the CSS that it needs. Um, and this means that the CSS or the size of the CSS file that it outputs uh, kind of plateaus even when the project grows to be much larger, which isn't always the case with some other frameworks. Um, it also helps uh, with readability and maintainability within those code bases. Uh, it's predictable. Basically, unlike a normal CSS system, the last style that you apply will always win. Uh, there's not really specificity to worry about. Um, it really just depends on which one you apply last, which makes it a lot easier to determine where issues are coming from if you have a, a CSS bug. Um, you can also assign a apply these styles conditionally uh, because it's done with JavaScript. There are ways to effectively apply styles only in certain cases that might be difficult to do using uh, just normal CSS. But that's kind of just a natural part of, of being JavaScript based. And it's fast. Uh, even though it's CSS and JavaScript, it compiles to a just a normal CSS file. It works on runtime the same as, as a normal CSS library. So in terms of the uh, the fundamental aspects of the StyleX system, basically styles are meant to be written locally in the same place as the markup for the component. So a component will have like a set of styles at the top that apply to it, um, which helps with the compartmented abilities that I mentioned earlier, like being able to publish the component and download it and have the default styles actually available. Um, deterministic resolution, which is what I mentioned before, where the last style applied always wins. and You don't have to deal with uh, CSS uh, specificity rules. And then in terms of the API, it's actually very simple. The vast majority of how it works is just based on common JavaScript patterns. And there are really two main functions. Uh, there's create and props, which are for creating styles and applying them. There are some other uh, functions that I'll look at later that do some more specific functionality, but you can achieve a lot with just those two. So one thing that doesn't usually apply to CSS, but is a thing with StyleX is encapsulation. It's a, a pretty common object-oriented programming design principle. 
where you kind of want to keep things encapsulated, uh, basically contained within the package so you don't have other things affecting it that they shouldn't. Um, and so it does this through disallowing uh, certain classes of selectors, like we can see here, regular CSS allows you to, to write some rules that can have interesting effects depending on how you use them. Um, and they can be somewhat unpredictable depending on everything that kind of requires rules to manage them. Whereas these are not a thing in Stylex, which there are pros and cons, but for maintainability and just being able to predict how it's going to actually work, it should be a good thing. One thing that I th thought was really interesting was, um, so it's compatible with TypeScript and all of it is strongly typed, but this means that you can actually leverage that to enforce what styles are actually allowed to be applied to a component. So like, so you have like a button style or a, or a button component. You have the styles for the buttons in that uh, using the typed uh, styles. Effectively, you can only allow them to use certain properties, so you can kind of enforce a, a brand or something if you need to. Uh, like over here, if we see uh, this first example, which only accepts colors and background colors, then you can also do something where you explicitly disallow certain things, uh, but allow everything else. So like here, we just don't allow them to use margins, but everything else is allowed. And that kind of, uh, it allows you to keep consistency where it's needed while maintaining the ability to customize how it looks, which I thought was really interesting. And so for defining styles, it's actually relatively simple when you look at it. So it, it depends on compilation. So you kind of have to write your styles in formats that the, the compiler will actually understand. Um, I mean, it's based on JavaScript. So these are like plain objects, strings, numbers, etc. You can see here, the color is just a string uh, with an RGB value. And then font size and line height are numbers. So you can actually use arrow functions to do dynamic styles, which I'll look at a little bit later. Um, but other function calls and then values imported from other modules are not allowed. Pseudo classes and pseudo elements are pretty straightforward. Basically, you can nest them within properties. Uh, so we see background color on hover equals blue, active, dark blue, pretty easily readable. Pseudo elements, they actually discourage them uh, for the most part if you can avoid them. But when they are required for something like a placeholder on a form field, um, you can just implement them pretty similarly to how you would implement the, the pseudo classes just at the, the top level of the style. Media queries, also pretty straightforward. You can just nest them within properties. We have the, the at media rule here. Pretty easily readable. You can also combine these uh, so you can have like a hover state with a media query in it. Fallback styles, there's actually a special function to handle that, which I thought was, inter was interesting. So the first that works function will do what it says <laughs> and uh, take the first that works. Um, and obviously this is a, a pretty common thing that comes up when maybe a browser doesn't support something the way everyone else does and you need to implement a uh, prefix or a fallback. Keyframe animations can be defined with the keyframes function. So we see here, we have this uh, keyframes function calling from and to with some styles applied. And then we can just call it in the style 
as we would with any other style. Dynamic styles, uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, feature of this. Because it relies on compilation, you kind of have to know the styles ahead of time. So the compiler knows the styles and it can actually compile the CSS. But this isn't always possible in every case. So you can do dynamic styles using functions. Um, but the function body has to be a just a literal object. So we see here, we have uh, a style defined that is a height function. It takes height in and then returns an object with the height property. And then here we can have a use state that might change dynamically. Uh, it controls the height and we can call the style with the height. So uh, lastly, to use the styles is actually pretty simple. Um, all we have to do is we look at the styles we defined. We have two defined styles here, base and highlighted. For a single one, pretty straightforward, just do styles.base. So styles.base gets the styles as you would expect. And then multiple styles, basically the same thing, except you just list them uh, with a comma. And as discussed previously, it will just take, if there are conflicts in what styles are being applied, like we see here, the color is gray and highlighted color is Rebecca purple. In this case, highlighted comes last. So it was the last applied. So it will take the highlighted color. Any questions? Seeing the way uh, they have like media queries and like the um, like the scaffolding built out kind of reminds me of that um, utility or mix in I think that you built for doing responsive styles in SAS, right? It's declaring it all within that same element instead of kind of all over the place in your SAS file. So it's somewhat better compartmentalized and easier to read and understand when you need to go back to it uh, at times. But yeah, that's kind of the only thought I had. It yeah, seems, um, Gabe, and I, uh, that it, this would be good with like React because you're writing most of everything inside of JavaScript. Um, how do you think this would translate if you weren't using something like React? I'm not entirely sure that you can use it without a framework along those lines. Um, because as mentioned previously, it requires compilation to work. You're not really compiling like a DNN site. You can't really <clears throat> do that in the same way. Um, so it's not really designed for that. It's kind of designed for JavaScript based UIs. It doesn't require JavaScript or it doesn't require React specifically, but something that works along those same lines is a prereq. And then what was the idea behind the um, um, the pseudo elements? You said that it was discouraged to use them? It yes, basically for things like before and after, it says that they would, they would encourage you to use like a span or something instead in those cases. Um, it doesn't mean you have to. <laughs> As shown on that slide, you can apply styles to pseudo elements. And in some cases, a pseudo element really isn't swappable for something like a span. Like uh, the example was placeholder, which that's kind of a unique property. You can't really replace that with the, an element. Yeah, interesting. I'm trying to understand if it would uh, what the process is when you're when you're writing your code and you're trying to troubleshoot something because you're writing it in JavaScript, it's generating the CSS for it. You're also declaring your properties in your like React template file, right? 
when you're trying to like find yes. why this isn't applying or what's actually being generated, you need to go look at the CSS file, look at your markup, look at the classes. I guess it's kind of the same thing we do now when we're trying to troubleshoot. I don't know if I, I'm now so, feeling like old school and maybe that just feels easier because it's what I know, but I don't know. So if we look back at a previous slide, So this is a, a big factor in that. So when you apply styles to an element, it will only apply to that element. <laughs> um, it's not going to apply to anything else, really. That's why you have like, this type of selector is not allowed. You can't target the child of an element. Um, so that means effectively when you're debugging something, and there's a style issue with a specific piece. You go to that piece. And the issue is there. <laughs> um, which I think, at least in theory, makes it pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, but just the way that it compiles the styles uh, prevents that type of thing. Can you go forward to one of the examples that's showing kind of the markup? Uh, uh, which type? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry, there are a lot. Uh, you want defining or applying? I guess this has both. Okay. So, <laughs> Is the class that being output the the name for it would be base? So whatever that like card has a class name of base, and then the properties you're defining is font size, line height, and color, or is that just the base styles for that element? I believe it outputs it. It doesn't output classes traditionally. <laughs> mm. um, I'm not. I'm not an expert on atomic CSS, but from what I understand, it it targets like specific elements. Um, this I, is I just the name, so I think it I think it will technically output that class, but I would I would have to check. I pulled up some page example from their website, and uh, like the class name that's output is like just a bunch of weird numbers and letters and. Maybe that's what atomic is, and that's what it's doing. But it's a uh, like that part is like maybe it gives yeah, you a small output because it's. Another documentation mentioned that basically the way it works um, is a lot more efficient uh, than what you could realistically achieve by hand coding the CSS, which. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in exactly how that works, but it's interesting. The idea that there are no like class names that you have to define is kind of interesting because it's all getting generated. Not randomly, but not by a decision that you had to make it means you just get to focus on creating your styles and outputting them the way your design calls for. Yeah. You still have to define, obviously, the names of the styles, but they don't really have, they're very self-contained, mm -hmm. which is a, a benefit of encapsulation. Yeah. That's what I understood as one of the big benefits of this. Um, and it says class names on an element can only directly style that same element. So, you, and I think you were talking about that, Gabe. Yeah. So like you can't, you're not going to target like the wrapper and then the interior child div or something and style it. <clears throat> yeah, you can't target children. Yeah, You have to target the element itself, which in the context of like a React project works pretty well, um, just because you're using templates for everything effectively. So you have direct control over the output for the most part, um, and you can target them manually using those styles.
definitely interesting. I, I wonder if it'll evolve into like if, um, because this seems in line with sort of how Daniel builds too sexy and in the type mode and uh, some of the stuff that's coming out in version 17 um, that will require you to um, uh, run um, the newest um, C uh, sharp, I think. I don't know, whatever. Oh, I forget what it's called, but um, you can't install version 17 now without being in 9.11 and then installing some um, the newest C sharp or something thing. I, I did it on one site, but it's in the library. Um, so like the newest versions of Too Sexy are all going into not only typed mode, but also forcing you to use C sharp's newest, which is also <laughs> typed code. So everything's going to this typed. Um, and as documentation, you know, TypeScript. So if you use TypeScript with like style X and then you compiled it, uh, you know, would this be the avenue that Too Sexy ends up going down? Um, I, I definitely certainly can see that being a strong possibility that this would be, um, would potentially replace SAS at some point down the road um, for a lot of the Too Sexy apps. Yeah, I, it's interesting trying to think about how that would be applied because it definitely needs to know. It, it compiles ahead of time and it kind of needs to know all of the elements that exist. It would be interesting to see how that gets well, you would applied have, in your type frameworks, right? You'd have, you probably would have separate CSS that's maybe not involved in this, it's more static and then this that's compiled. Um, I, I don't know. Certainly interesting because it's very tailwind and the idea that the um, reducing how much CSS is uh, below is used and this really reduces that. It it looks like it outputs individual CSS properties similar to tailwind and it applies those as classes to the components. So it does something very similar to Tailwind, right? But it's even smaller potentially. I think because it's keeping yeah. it in that one file is why people, or like at least the little bit that I, when I first heard about it, read about that people like is like your, your CSS and JS is all together and what works together is all sort of packaged together. It's not in these separate files. You're not having to chase it down. It's all like encapsulated right there. And, and you're not having to worry about making some style change and then affecting some other component, even though they use the same styles. And I think the idea of that is is very cool because, like, in a lot of projects, you will pull in things from like npm to use because maybe someone's already built a date picker and you don't want to make one from scratch. Um, but if you're using StyleX and they were using StyleX for that component, then they might might be able to just uh, overwrite what you need while keeping the base styles while not affecting anything else on the page. That's just like an easy way to do that. Um, and based on the types that are enforced, it allows you to, as I mentioned before, kind of control what people are allowed to change and what they aren't. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our Gorilla Learning Lab. We have a lot more banana tidbits for you to get ape over. Check out our other videos or visit our website at www.10poundgorilla.com. I'm swinging on out of here. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You're not subscribed? That's bananas!